Welcome into another edition of the Hang Time Podcast. Seku Smith here in Atlanta. My main man, John Schumann, is in New Jersey. Our producer, John Hartzell, behind the glass. Two games in... Two, well, two game nights in, rather, shoe to this NBA season. We spent so much time talking about the lead up to the season. Now we're actually in the mix. So many storylines. The one and only one that you should care about, though, is Devin Booker is the front runner for MVP after one game. I'm sure you saw the highlights of what he did to the Dallas Mavericks in the Phoenix Suns' first game. Grand Rapids, Michigan's own Devin Booker. Kia MVP, just throwing that out there now. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to uh, Tim Bontemps of the Washington Post, get his takeaways from the first two nights of the season and his annual top 100 players list is a real talker. But before we get to that, shoot, let's talk storylines from these first 13 games we've seen. We had Tuesday's opening night on TNT, the doubleheader, the Celtics and the Sixers, fantastic game. And then we got the Warriors ring night ceremony with their uh, Transformer rings. And, you know, they had an interesting game that could have gone either way at some at one point when you think about how the Thunder played in the second half. But, of course, uh, the Warriors kind of rose to the occasion as they've often done. What's your big takeaway from these first couple nights in, in terms of who jumped out at you, what jumped out at you from what you saw in all these games? Well, I think for the first night, first of all, I don't have any grand takeaway from – Oklahoma City, Golden State. I mean, Oklahoma mm-hmm. City was out with without uh, Russell Westbrook. It was ring night, weird sort of night. And Draymond Green kind of played limited minutes and Clay Thompson couldn't make a three. And so the Warriors are still the Warriors. But I thought the, the Boston-Philadelphia game was interesting. I think we saw right away Philadelphia suffering from a lack of shooting, you know, and, and being hurt by the departures of, of Bellinelli and Ilyasova. They got outscored. They sort of out they outscored the, the the Celtics pretty well in the paint and and on free throws but they got outscored 61 to 23 on shots from outside the paint 14 of those 23 came from JJ Redick who didn't shoot particularly well but he was the only guy making an outside shot basically for the Sixers Embiid had a three uh, Covington had a couple threes but I think we saw just sort of maybe what their fear is now that they've lost something offensively with the departures of those two guys and with you know, Markel Fultz still not eager to shoot from the perimeter. I mean, he passed up a couple of open threes in order to try to get closer to the basket, and that didn't work out. Boston, I mean, (laughs) Kyrie Irving shot terrible. Gordon Hayward did not have a very good game, and they still won fairly easily against one of the one of the other good teams in the conference. So that's because their best player is Jason Tatum, <laughs> or Al Horford, or Al Horford. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's, I'm I'm not saying that just to to troll. I'm saying yeah. You can make a legitimate case for either one of those guys being Boston's best player this year. Tatum was fantastic, and obviously I think there's probably no team better equipped to defend Joel Embiid than Boston is with both Horford and Aaron Baines. Aaron Baines. You know, those yeah. guys, they, they'll give up an inch, but they, they you know, when Embiid is trying to get close to the basket, I mean, they are tough, and they know how to sort of stay in his body, keep him from – from being out, el- being able to elevate too easily, and and uh, obviously they were they were fantastic. So that was a, a sort of my big takeaway from from that first night was Boston just being incredibly deep and mm. t- incredibly talented from one to basically eight or nine. Marcus Morris, you know, we were ready to sort of break Great him off, off and he just hit big yeah. shots for them. And then Philly, like I said, lack of perimeter shooting coming to to hurt them right away, and I, I think that's going to be sort of fascinating to see who can sort of come out and shoot better for those guys, whether they can get the same sort of player movement that they had in the playoffs with, with Bell and Ellie. They looked exactly the same to me without those guys as they did. I just felt like they were still missing another dynamic playmaker score impact player. I don't, and even when they had Bellinelli and Ilyasova, I just didn't think they matched up as well with the Celtics as they might have against Toronto or somebody else. Is it, is it another shooter that they need? Do you think, or is it, uh, just another dynamic player. Like they, they have to have somebody become that third piece. Well, yeah, I think it's for- it's another shooter that's not going to get burned on the other end of the floor. That's the. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, if you remember that series last year, the Celtics attacked Bellinelli and Redick in isolation as as often as they could, and and right. so while Bellinelli was giving the Sixers something with just his movement and his relentless like relentless movement off the ball and his willingness to just take a handoff and launch right away. I mean, that just has the defense on his toes. He was getting burned on the other end of the floor as well. So, yeah, they need and they need maybe another two-way player, a guy that can help them 
offensively, but not be a liability on the other end of the floor. I mean, they need maybe another, like, I hate to say it, but like a Jimmy Butler type, you know, not necessarily, you know, <laughs> it's, that's, you know, the kind don't of, start that. Don't start the that. kind this of guy, guy they, they need a guy, two-way player, you know, another guy. Don't, don't start the Jimmy Butler stuff. Shoot. I, don't want, I mean, I don't even want to do I understand. I, 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 do, understand but. I do want to, I do want to highlight though, there was, there was, it's the first impressions and, and that's what opening night is for everybody is, you know, that opportunity to make a first impression. There were a lot of young guys who stood out. I thought Orlando's young guys, Aaron Gordon, Bamba, and Jonathan Isaac, you know, showed me a little something in that game against Miami. DeAndre Ayton looked really good for the Suns. Giannis in the Bucks had a crazy game. That was that, um, I was watching that one, and that one was kind of fascinating because yeah. in the first half, their offense was unstoppable. They had the number one offense in the preseason, and it carried over in the to the first 24 minutes last night in Charlotte. Bud ball, baby. And then it – all of a sudden just got really stagnant in the second half. I was watching, I mean, the, the, the Hornets were basically switching everything from the start of the game, but I maybe they were just overhelping or something in the first half where the Bucks were able to get penetration and kick out to, to shooters. In the second half, they just couldn't, they just couldn't get the open shots. The Hornets actually got into a game, got back into the game with a lineup with Batum at center. They had Kemba Walker. I like that wrinkle. Yeah. I like that's that's James Borrego throwing a, a monkey wrench. It was interesting. Like Kemba Walker, Tony Parker, Malik Monk, Kid Gilchrist, and Batum. They started the fourth quarter. Batum is guarding Brooke Lopez, and the Bucks immediately went to him, and he scored easily in the post. And then that just didn't happen again. Maybe there was one possession where Lopez had Kemba Walker switched on to Lopez and. Giannis just sort of ignored him, drove into the paint and got blocked. But also like Brooke Lopez maybe isn't is now one of those centers that drifts to the perimeter more than he than he like seeks a mismatch and tries to get into the paint and get easy buckets. So that was kind of fascinating that the, the Hornets getting back into that game with with a, a small lineup and then you know the Bucks just hadn't just had just barely enough to pull it out. But it was kind of interesting to see the sort of the highs and the lows of of <laughs> Milwaukee again, where you know sometimes they just look terrific. Sometimes they do not, and it sort of played out in game one. Did we, and I felt like this last night, that we kind of glossed over a lot of other emerging storylines leading up to the start of the season because we spent so much time talking about Jimmy Butler, because we spent so much time talking about Kawhi playing, you know, in his first game in Toronto, and because we've put so much energy into the Lakers and LeBron and his, you know, first regular season showing with the Lakers, which comes tonight on TNT, obviously. Um, that we didn't maybe pay attention to some of these other storylines that have kind of floated around out there. I, nobody, we don't even talk about DeMar DeRozan and in, in what he what impact he would have on the Spurs. But I thought he played a really nice game. He looked comfortable and didn't shoot great, but he shot well enough. And when the game was on the line, the, the his new teammates had no problems with him closing out a game, something that he got criticized for often for not being able to do when he was in Toronto. What other under-the-radar performances or things that you saw that we maybe didn't pay attention to stuck out to you after, you know, looking over the action from these first two games? Well, I mean, I think you got to point out New Orleans just having a terrific debut in Houston. I haven't watched yeah. that game yet, but I'll give you my most favorite fascinating stat of the season so far <laughs> last season over 82 games the Rockets trailed by 20 points or more for just a total of 13.2 minutes which is amazing they trailed by 20 or more for only 13 minutes last night they trailed New Orleans by 12.2 minutes so they basically almost they they trailed by 20 or more for almost as many minutes last night as they did all of last season which is that's, um, that's which is just incredible but I did watch that I did watch that Minnesota San Antonio game and I think San Antonio is okay. already missing uh, Dejounte Murray because Jeff Teague was attacking Bryn Forbes like he wasn't even there. He had Bryn right. Forbes on his heel, and he was providing like sort of no resistance. Jeff Teague had a big game, but the one thing out of that game is Carl Anthony Towns had got six shots in his minute. I mean, he fouled out, didn't play that much, but still, he was like seventh on the team if you just look at field goal attempts per per minute. And for some reason, they just cannot. The guys seven feet he's one of the best shooters in the world and they're they're they just gave him a, a max contract extension and for some reason they can't get plays to get him shots and so that's i think that continues to be uh an issue in minnesota though defense was probably their bigger issue last night yeah he struggled but he wasn't the only one obviously I, you mentioned the pelicans and the rockets i i was shocked and i and i watched the playback those games when they repeat them at like four o'clock in the morning and 
you're foolishly still awake because you can't go to sleep as you've been on the set at NBA TV until 11 o'clock at night. Anyway, so I'm watching the the playback of the Pelicans Rockets, which I was focusing on on the set last night, but not my, you know, devote my entire attention to it. And shoot, I was shocked at how easily – and I knew there were going to be some some defensive issues for the Rockets without Trevor Ariza, without Luke Mbamute. But the Pelicans went through them with ease. Like, they didn't have any problem getting up and down the court, finishing right down the middle of the lane at the rim when they wanted to. Anthony Davis got whatever he wanted. Julius Randle got whatever he wanted. Drew Holiday didn't even have a big game. He didn't even, you know, go berserk at all. And they still thumped. I mean, thump the Rockets. It was not competitive. And I don't know if I, I – I almost feel like the Rockets, by doing what they did last year, getting to the conference finals, game seven on their home floor, James Harden finally winning an MVP, almost like they think they've arrived already and they haven't won anything. And, and they make me nervous as a, as a team that we've all pointed to as a contender, a team that's going to be one of the big-time teams, and then they go out and perform like that on open night. Last year – Totally different story. They go and ruin ring night for the Warriors at Oracle, and then they show up last night and lay an egg. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get the psyche that goes into a performance like they gave last night. I'm not going to um, look too much into one game. Of course I, we are. I, what are you talking about? I think in that regard, I think Chris Paul should keep them motivated. I mean, he's got to be the hungry, hungriest right. dude in the league right now as far as trying to win a championship. Yeah, but, it, I mean, it's not – I mean, he, that has to infect everybody else. Chris Paul competes like a wild man every night. <laughs> but they had a bunch of guys who just looked like they could have cared less about working on a defensive end and were trying to, you know, match bucket for bucket, and they couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't watched that game. I did see some stuff online. Guy Jared Dubin had a nice little uh, clip about New Orleans taking advantage of Houston on switches, Anthony Davis in particular in the paint, but also Julius Randle, um, I believe, took some took advantage of some switches. I mean, that's – that's Houston's defense and if you have big guys who can take care uh, take advantage of that stuff take advantage of the smaller guys you know Harden Paul uh, James Ennis in the paint and Anthony Davis is one of those guys that is big but can also play one-on-one in the post and and outside maybe you can take advantage of, of Houston's defense better than some other team Sure, we know what it looks like to us, and we blather on about this stuff all the time. Let's get a different perspective. Somebody else who's taking a look at the league with a different set of eyeballs and has a different view on these things. Tim Bontemps, the Washington Post National NBA writer, joins us here for the first time on the Hangtime Podcast. Tim, appreciate you joining us. I know you're out in Portland getting ready for uh, LeBron Palooza or whatever they're calling the traveling circus that is that Lakers showcase these days. We appreciate you taking some time, man. First and foremost, what is the the vibe around the Lakers and, and in that city right now getting ready for their TNT showdown tonight? Well, first of all, fun to be on with you and you and my man Schumann. But yeah, it's uh it's gonna be really interesting. I, I spent the the first week of the preseason or first week of games uh, around the Lakers. And I'm just genuinely fascinated by this roster and how this team is going to look. As you guys both know, LeBron has had a ton of success over the past several years playing, you know, basically one style, which is him with the ball in his hands, surrounded by a lot of excellent three point shooters. And this team can't really play that style. They don't really have, you know, they've got one or two good three-point shooters, and that's really it. They don't have any size. JaVale McGee is the only legit big on the roster, you know, and even I think some would argue how legitimate he actually is. Uh, you know, they don't they don't have very many good defenders uh, in a vacuum. They have a couple, but so it's – and they have a lot of guys who need the ball in their hand. It's just going to be a lot of pieces that have to be fit together, and I think they might be more interesting than any team in the league to watch just because I personally don't have any idea what they're going to look like when – you know, when the bullets are live here in a few hours and they're they're playing against teams going full speed for 48 minutes. So much of the attention is is on LeBron, of course. Who's the guy on that Lakers team in your, in your mind that has to have that exceptional season to support LeBron? He's always had, you know, since right. he went to Miami the first time, he's always had somebody else who was that second guy that, that could play at an elite level. Which one of these guys on this Lakers roster is capable or maybe is the one that has to be that guy. Right. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote a column about why I think the Lakers are going to miss the playoffs. Yes. And I even I said the at the end of it, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's what, that's what happens when you say something negative about the Lakers. <laughs> but I said at the end of that column that if I'm going to be wrong about the Lakers, it's because Brandon Ingram takes a big step forward. And that I, I don't think the Lakers are going to stink. I just think they're going to win around 45 games. And in the West, I don't think that will be quite enough to get in the playoffs. But that being said, LeBron could obviously get them in by himself. But 
to be the kind of team that some people think they can be, which is like having home court advantage in the first round in the West or like having a legit chance to win a playoff series. Brandon Ingram has to become, to me, a, you know, that second guy you're talking about, like a legit, you know, 20 point a game option who can attack defenses and really be that secondary scorer um, and, you know, real threat for the Lakers next to him. I, I'm skeptical he can do that. His three point shot has not looked good in the preseason. Again, he, his, his percentage ticked up last year, but he didn't even take two attempts a game. So I don't really pay much attention to that. But he is the guy to me that if they, if they are going to exceed my expectations for them, it's because Brandon Ingram looks like he's on the path of being a star. And then, you know, LeBron with a second star with some decent support pieces is, is definitely good enough to be that kind of a team. Is, is there any sense that the Warriors, uh, are, I know they haven't concerned themselves with much of anyone during this run. But given their battles with LeBron the past four years, are, are they paying particular attention to the Lakers maybe just even in a cursory manner to, you know, to make sure they keep an eye on the one guy who's had something for them during this stretch? To be honest, Seku, I, I mean, they're paying a little bit of attention I, just because everybody is kind of curious to see what it looks like. But it, I, I don't think they're that focused on them. To be honest, they're just trying to make sure that their own – house is in order you saw the other night you know I was at the game in the bay the opener against the thunder they you know they're, they're still they still got a lot of rust to shake off they didn't really do much in the preseason you know Steve Kerr said after the game they're not really in shape they didn't play well and that you know that kind of reflected itself in them having a close game against Oklahoma City without Russell Westbrook and you know they just they've really spent the last month trying to go out of their way to have a different mindset than they did last year you know they went to China obviously for the preseason last year they came back they spent all season talking about how hard it was going to be to repeat. And they just looked like they were stuck in cement basically all season long, even though they won a title. And I think they're really trying, they're, they're, you know, they're really trying to make sure they have a different positive energy around the team and, you know, and figure things out from that standpoint, rather than, you know, worrying about where LeBron is at. Cause frankly, I don't think they look at the Lakers as, you know, even though LeBron is there, unless something changes, I don't think they look at them as a real threat to give them any trouble. Yeah. Tim, I, I was fascinated to scan your top 100 players for the 2018-19 season. It's one of those things where I guess all of us sports writers at some point or another have done the list or the put our ballot out there, whatever. This is this is an undertaking, though, that invites all kinds of drama. When you're talking about ranking the players in the league and you know they're going to hear about it, see it, people are going to have opinions about it. it, it's done fantastically. Jose Luis Soto did the illustration, which to me makes it even more crazy to, to play with because you got all of these categories, statistics, age, all these different things. I'm curious in putting it together and in, in having to come up with a real defined order of players in this league what sticks out to you about the makeup of the list in total and really the top 20 to 25 guys? Like, how do you boil that down based on – is it accomplishment? Is it projection of what they're going to be this year upcoming? You know, is it more based on their history? You know, how do you come up with a formula that works for you to put together a list like this? Well – I mean, listen, first of all, like you said, full credit to Jose Soto, who is just an unbelievable artist at our place. And the, the like I like I tell him all the time, the people people care about the interactive stuff is cool, but people really care about this thing because of the illustrations, which I, I think are awesome and even more than my blathering on about how good these players are, that's really what makes this list stand out but the way it's kind of impossible to do a list like this after the top 10 or 12 guys because mm -hmm. like if anybody listening wants to just do like do this as an exercise just rank the top 10 players in the league which you probably can do pretty easily and then start then do like the next 20 by the time you get to like 25 or 30 it, it's impossible to try to determine uh you know whether donovan mitchell is better than devin booker or kevin love or like you know like Rudy Gobert like these guys are so unique in their abilities that that everything is different and it's hard to determine exactly how to do it but for me the way I look at it is I try to to focus on how these guys are going to be this season you know the way I look at that list is it's not based on future projections it's not based on you know if you know say Dirk Nowitzki is 38 and you know DeAndre Ayton's 19 I, I'm not worried I mean, it's not a projection of the next three years it's like if you were drafted a team this year Right. How would this guy help you win games this year? So that that's kind of the way I try to approach it. And by no means do I think it's perfect because, like I said, it's an impossible exercise to 
to pull off, but it, it's a fun thing to do. And, and it's fun to get to show off his work and to, uh, you know, to give stuff, to give people something to talk about because it is the kind of thing that, you know, that fans get into and, and it's, uh, you know, an easy talking point for people. No question. Which player got the most pushback from readers? Who was the guy that people were most adamant about that was in a place he shouldn't have been? Kyrie Irving at 24. People got mm-hmm. very wound up about. <laughs> uh, people got very wound up about Clint Capella at 20. People got – there's one other guy that I can't uh, – think of right now there was some pushback on on the other lakers being low mm-hmm. on the list but yeah Kyrie was the main one at 24 people wanted Kyrie to be much higher yeah and and that's what i'm saying it's it's hard to to gauge you know if you're talking about accomplishments then the list is totally different you know what i mean it's right if you were just doing one category but if this is a comprehensive thing where you're using all these different factors to put it together then it has to be a, an accurate reflection of a number of different things uh Shu and i talk a lot of times about the fact that you could and we mentioned it earlier on this podcast you could make a case that Jason Tatum and Al Horford are Boston's best players ahead of Kyrie or Gordon Hayward which according to your top 100 that would be pretty spot on right is there anyone else on this list that you look at and say what his value is to his particular team and what his value is in the larger context of the league is maybe something that would cause people to, to do a double take. I look at Jimmy Butler and when I start ranking the the players in the league, just in my head, like you said, you, you do the top 10, then you start going down that, that next 10, the next 10, next 10. Right. He, he wouldn't be in my top 15 probably, but he probably should be when you just look at what he brings to the game, you know, the, the, the two way abilities that he has, he probably yep. is a guy that should be valued more than some of us value him be, based on his situations and the things he's been involved with. Yeah, I mean, I would say the guy in my head that, that fits that criteria based off the list is, is Clint Capella with the Rockets. You know, I had him ahead of Nikola Jokic. I had him ahead of Carl Towns. And a lot of people would probably disagree with me on that. But the way I look at him is, like, you know, both Towns and Jokic are undeniably more skilled offensive players. I mean, they're two maybe the most skilled centers in the history of the game offensively but you look at you look at both of them and they're such they to this point in their careers have been such negatives defensively Jokic in particular I just don't know if you can build a title contending team around Nikola Jokic like it, having a center who's that bad on defense can you really be a really good team or are you a you know, just a good, solid team. You know, obviously that Denver team's got a lot of talent. We're going to find out the next couple of years, like what their ceiling really is. But I look at Capella, and to me, he is the prototypical center for the modern game, right? A guy who I watched him switch on to Kevin Durant and not look lost in the Western Conference Finals last year. A guy who is an elite rim runner, perfectly placed with James Harden and Chris Paul on that team can sky, you know, above the box and get the ball, you know, and, and on a team that doesn't have a lot of good defensive players, obviously last night they didn't look too hot against the Pelicans, but mm-hmm. you know, he's a guy who can cover up for a lot of mistakes. So I think he's a lot more portable to a lot of different teams and a lot of different situations. And I, I value that pretty highly. You know, I'm pretty bullish on him now. Maybe I'll end up looking silly in a year and he'll be lower, but you know, that, that I think that's a good example to your point of a guy who, you know, I, I think is, very valuable for the things he brings to the table that maybe other people would look at and and not quite under, not quite agree with my assessment. Yeah, I was thinking about which player would be most upset about where he ranked on this list, and I hate to single this guy out because he's one of my favorite guys to talk to in the league and always has been. But I guarantee you, John Wall, if somebody was to put this list in front of him, if he saw he was 25th, he'd be complaining about the fact that he should be in the top 10. And that's just – Right. I, I appreciate well, last year, for, and like, for example, for example, last year he was like, I don't know, 12th or something. Mm-hmm. And he missed half the season and he had multiple knee issues, right? right? So this year he's lower. And if he's back to where he was two years ago, he'll be back in the top 15 again, mm-hmm. you know? But to your point, like, it's hard to it's hard to gauge that stuff out. Yeah. If – if I'm looking at this top, let's say I'm taking the top 30 guys all the way up to Drew Holiday. Who who do you think has the opportunity to climb this season? You know, because this is about what they're going to do. But who do you think, if, if we look up at the end of the season, say which one of these guys would make the biggest move in that top 30? Who would you pick out? Well, I mean, Towns, obviously, I think if he becomes the player he should be, could I mean, he was in the top 10 last year. He could take a big jump up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Booker, I want to say Booker, Mitchell, and Tatum mm-hmm. are all in the like 31 to 35 range. 
Right. Um, I could see all three of those guys making a big leap uh, this year. You know, I think, you know, I was trying to think of if there's another young guy that's in that mix. I think those are probably the, the three best candidates, though. Devin Bradley and uh, or Bradley, Devin Donovan and uh, and Jason all all are in that that range just outside the top thirty. And if if you told me a year from now they're all in the top fifteen or twenty, that wouldn't wouldn't surprise me in the least. Again, like I said, I, I love this kind of stuff. Um, I, I know what kind of uh, a talker it can be on social media, you know. And and to be honest with you, not everybody is brave enough to do these sorts of things because it it does take a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of critical thought about how to place guys. It's just one thing to to fill out a ballot. You know, we all do that. And since they've become public, I, I like that even more because now I get to see where other people stand sometimes on the same issue I'm dealing with at the end of every season. Like, how do I, you know, determine which one of these guys goes where on this all NBA ballot or whatever? And and I was thinking about going away from the list, but now just thinking about the season. The Spurs are a team, Tim, that I know we've kind of always overlooked as a, you know, as a body, the media, but they got two guys who were among the, you know, the all NBA selections last year on their roster. And people think they might miss the playoffs because, you know, the injuries and Kawhi leaving, but they got DeMar DeRozan and LaMarcus Aldridge. When I think about, you know, where these players fit in the larger landscape of the league, shouldn't that make us push the Spurs up the, the pecking order when they got those two guys basically in the physical primes of their career? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, a lot of people have written off the Spurs, you know, especially after losing DeJounte Murray, which really hurts because I thought he had a chance to maybe be the most approved player this year. And, and there was a lot of noise coming out of San Antonio, a place where noise doesn't really come out of normally that he was going to have a monster year. So, I mean, look, that hurt them. But at the same time, to your point, I mean, they do have Mark Saldridge and DeMar DeRozan on their team who are both – you know, if not definite all NBA players, uh, you know, the last couple of years are certainly borderline guys, right? So yeah. if you have two of the top 25 or 30 players in your team, I don't see how that team is going to be, you know, winning 40 games and missing the playoffs, right? And that's before you factor in the fact that you've got Greg Popovich there, you've got the institution that is dispersed, the, the, knowing that they're going to show up and do their job. I mean, last night's a perfect example, right? They, yeah. They, they get Minnesota at home. They, they win that game. I mean, they're, they're just going to win. They're going to win a lot of games at home. They're going to win every game they should win. They're going to beat all the bad teams in the East when they play them. You know, they're not going to take nights off. I, I know it's a popular thing to say they're going to miss the playoffs, that they're not going to be that good. But, uh, you know, to me, Tamar and LaMarcus and, and Pop together, I, I think is enough to get that team into the top eight in the West. Yeah, I, I definitely think. I, I'm going to have to rearrange my uh, my thinking about some of these teams. And I know – Shu and I were talking about it's just being one game. You can't, you know, make too many lasting judgments off the first night of the season. But there were some things I, I, I think there was uh, some emotions I had about teams based on what went on in free agency in the summer and trades, whatever. And then there was some reality that set in after I started watching games last night and thinking, all right, well, maybe I need to rethink that. And I, I downplayed some teams. I didn't think Orlando would, would strike me as much of anything. And then I watched them last night jump on Miami and get some big minutes out of their young front court. I mean, it's, I think we have to remember to not prejudge too much of what goes on in this league. I know we all make hotel plans for, for the Bay and, uh, and wherever LeBron is playing, you know, for June every year. But but maybe the, the other part of the season, maybe the 82 games will be a little bit more interesting than, than what we all think will be the finish. Tim Bontemps of the Washington Post joining us here on the Hangtime Podcast. And you can check out uh, all his work and his top 100 list on WashingtonPost.com. Tim, don't don't uh, go anywhere. We want to get Shu back on here because Shu cranks up a stat for me every week on the show here. And I'm usually pretty terrible at trying to guess it. Uh, you know, he's the numbers man. One of the premier yes, guys is. doing no it. So, so Shu, do you have a, a Schumann stat for us this week? Maybe Bontemps can help me get this thing right for you. <laughs> All right. So last night, Carmelo Anthony came off the bench for the first time in his career after play, after uh, starting the first 1,126 games of his career, mm-hmm. including postseason. So I want to see how quickly you can name the five active players who have played the most games without ever coming off the bench. <laughs> Hmm. This is a trick question because, because 
Has Le- I'm gonna guess LeBron, but I, I don't. Why do I remember him? No, LeBron, LeBron, LeBron has definitely come off the bench in a game. I was gonna say I remember him coming oh, yeah. off the bench at one time. Windhorse yeah. uh, told this story on a ESPN podcast earlier this week. Oh, uh, really? Okay. There was a, a game in 2007 where Anderson Varejao had held That's out. That's right. And LeBron was coming back from That's an injury, right. and so, so in in order to keep. Anderson Varejao from being booed when he came off the bench. That's right. LeBron came off the bench as well, and they both checked in at the same time. So that was the one game where <laughs> LeBron has come off the bench in his career. So basically, we're t- talking all high picks. Uh, let's see, we have a right. we have it's got, a yeah, Kevin two, Kevin Durant got to be one of them, right? Yes, Kevin Durant is number two at 899 games without ever coming off the bench. All right. Hmm. We have two number Chris one Paul. picks. Chris Paul, number one, nine hundred and eighty-four games without having ever come off. Montez, the you're in. You already gotten two right. You, you're good. You got you the go top over. two. Um, I never get the top. Two I never get this thing right. Two, two, two number, number one pick two, and a number two, six pick. And a number six. Two number two number the number six pick is Lillard. Correct. Five hundred and four. He's number three on the list. Love this. I'm gonna have Montez come back and answer the uh, Schumann stat every week. <laughs> <laughs> he's number three man that's pretty wild he's number three on the list he's only played like six years in the league yeah, number five on the list is is i think just going into his fifth season or maybe sixth season I'm not sure. so yeah. uh, what about Giannis? wiggins nope. wiggins correct he's number five 333 is the other one who's the other 494 one 94 career games never coming off the bench includes postseason former number one pick mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was trying to think of. Uh, oh, it, it, AD is the other one. No, no, incorrect. It's not Anthony Davis. Oh. Uh, a former it's number one pick? Kyrie? The Kyrie? Kyrie Irving, yes. Uh, Good job, Sekou. You got to, zero okay. out of five. I told you. I don't <laughs> Listen, I'm not a shooting stat guy. This is not my area of expertise. I don't. <laughs> so Chris Paul, Kevin Durant, Damian Lillard, Kyrie Irving, Andrew Wiggins are your top five active players with most games without ever having come off the bench. So basically Mike D'Antoni just ruined another list Carmelo uh, could have stayed on. Is that what <laughs> okay. you're telling me? This <laughs> <laughs> It was bound to happen at some point. I guess. But really, really, Billy Donovan should have pulled off that. Uh, yeah, I guess. But that was last year. But. That's inter- that's interesting. I the the drop, you know, in terms of you know LeBron and these guys who have had that kind of years, you know, those years of service. You know, you figure Durant obviously is not a shocker, but then to go all the way down to Wiggins, that's that's yeah. crazy. That's a and whole after him. After him, it's Towns. Yeah, I mean, that's unbelievable. Next on the list. Um. But, I mean, you think about it, how many rookies start from day one? That's a good it's point. I mean, I, I thought I mean, about that after I said Giannis. That he did, it's not like he did, came into the league, you know, as a right. starter and a, a surefire superstar. Right? When, and, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised AD didn't, has come off the bench in a game. possible he's come off the bench after coming back from an injury? I'm not sure. Well, that definitely could uh, be a possibility. Right. All right, so he has 424 career games, four, 419 starts. So five games he's come off the bench. Huh. Uh, and then four rookies started, you know, in the first two games of this season, there are four rookies that started. Aiton, Doncic, Trey Young, and, of course, Bruce Brown Jr. in Detroit. <laughs> That's right. Because the Pistons were banged up. So I think Shoot. that streak will come to an end at some point. I'm, I'm trying to think. So who I was trying to think who would be a guy that I'm surprised isn't on that list. Like I was thinking, and then you start thinking about injuries and all the other reasons why a guy would end up coming off the bench, like Blake Griffin. Is a is a guy you know? I know he's had the injury issues. I'm trying to think. One game, 581 games played, 580 starts. Yeah, I was gonna say when would he I come off the bench? The, I can't tell you what the scenario was. Yeah, but so after after Wiggins, it's Towns, Embiid, Tatum, Simmons. Basically, is where you get, and Simmons is you know just 92 career games, and yeah. so uh, and you know Towns, Embiid, Tatum, those guys will will climb. Well, Von Tim, you're hired. I don't care what. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says about your top one hundred. You killed the Schumann stat. You good to go around here for life. So, um, <laughs> we appreciate. It. Look, and and we'll be looking forward to to everything you you know you write off of uh, the the showcase tonight in Portland and beyond. Check out WashingtonPost dot com for all of Tim's work and uh, fantastic stuff as always. Appreciate you finally coming on, getting getting a chance to talk to you here on the Hang Time Podcast, Tim. Absolutely, fellas. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Good stuff as always. And we'll see you down the road, of course. We'll be back on Monday with another episode of the Hangtime Podcast. Uh, we'll go into uh, Schumann's Week 2 Power Rankings. And be sure to subscribe to Hangtime on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for episodes 
every Monday and Thursday all season long. Don't forget to leave a review. Thanks to Tim Bontemps of the Washington Post for joining us, and we'll see you right here next time on the Hang Time Podcast. Thank you.